Hey, welcome to APC Brampton TV. I'm Pastor Moses. I'm so glad that you're with us here today. Every week, we release powerful messages to encourage and strengthen you in your walk with God. And we hope that this message today will impact your life. Enjoy. Let's give God a round of applause this morning because he's awesome. Come on, he's awesome. He's awesome. Come on, you can do better than that. We serve an awesome God. Come on, did somebody come here to say we serve an awesome God? You didn't come here to listen to me because I got nothing to give you, but we can get something from the Holy Spirit in Jesus. So if you came to hear me, I'm sorry, I got nothing for you. But if you came to hear from the one who has created you, then we got something to be excited about. Hello, YouTube. I'm excited today. Are you excited today? We serve an awesome God that is mighty. He is mighty. First of all, I just want to say it is an absolute privilege and an honor to speak in front of all of you, to be able to share my heart and what God has taught me. I don't take that for granted, and it is an honor. You know, pastor talks about development, but do you know as a pastor, he doesn't have to do this. Hello? He doesn't have to. He's not obligated to share the pulpit, but he does because he cares about investing in others and seeing them fulfill the purpose that God has in their life. So we can just give the pastor of this church, Pastor Tony, and the eldership just a, a thank you and, a, and an honor that they are willing to put themselves on the line because they are obedient to God. Amen? So Pastor Tony, thank you, and I honor you for that. I'm excited this morning. I'm excited this morning. We are going to talk about Colossians 1. And the key verse here we're going to talk about is verse 15 to 23. So if you can open up your Bibles to Colossians 1, verse 15. I'm going to be reading from the King James Version. When you're there, say hallelujah. No, you got to add the R at the end. Some of you are lying because I didn't see you get there. Mm-mm. Lying in the house of God, eh? I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Hallelujah. Thank you, Alicia. So let's read from verse 15. And we're talking about Jesus here. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? Someone say every Every creature. For by him were all things created that were in heaven, that are on earth, visible and invisible. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Can you say amen to that? And he is, who are we talking about? Who are we talking about? Before all things, and by him all things consist. Verse 18. And he is what? The head of the body, the church. That's you and I. Who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. Verse 20, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things on the earth or things in heaven. So he reconciled things on earth and in heaven to what? Himself. Himself. Verse 21, and you that were sometime, sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now have been reconciled. Can you say amen to that? In the body of his flesh through death, to present you holy, unblameable, unreprovable in his sight. If you continue in the faith grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature, which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, made a, was made a minister. 
Father, we just thank you right now for your word. We thank you that your word is spirit and it is life. Father, I just pray right now in the name of Jesus that every stronghold will come down. Anything that would hinder us from hearing your word will be removed right now in the name of Jesus. I pray for open eyes and open ears to hear what the spirit of the Lord is saying. Father, I just pray that every word that is spoken, every meditation that comes from our heart will be pleasing and acceptable to you, our God. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone who believes that, say amen. What a fantastic word. The word speaks for itself. Amen? Come, I'm need some help this morning. I want to need some help. Don't be quiet on me. Thank you. <laughs> so we're going to be talking about Colossians 15, and it's really surrounding the preeminence of God. But before we get into the text, it's really, really important that we, we understand the context in which Paul was writing. See, this was done about uh, 60 to 61 A.D., so the thing to remember is, is this isn't a thousand years later. This, is, this isn't even a hundred years later. The same people who are alive in this area, in this church, some may have already seen Jesus or even part of the teachings or received from the teachings of Jesus Christ. So it wasn't that, that Jesus came in thousands of years has passed, and by the way, Paul is now speaking. Paul is actually writing this from jail because he heard about the teachings that were creeping into this church. And I want to tell you today that these teachings still exist today in the church and outside of the church. And these teachings came in from what we call the Gnostics. The word Gnostic actually means having knowledge or what they thought was knowledge. That's why the term agnostic means to not know. If someone is agnostic, they don't know if there's a God. They can't say there is or they can't say there isn't. But these people said we know truth and truth comes from our knowledge. They believe that the more that I gain knowledge, the more that I studied, the more that I went on YouTube, the more that I read blogs, the more that I listened to this person and that person, the more insight I got, the more I got closer in an understanding of who God really was. And Paul says, no, 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 this is heresy because everything that we need to know, everything that we are resides in Jesus Christ. So Paul says, I need to come and tell this church, hey, you've forgotten about the supremacy, the preeminence of Jesus Christ. And it was only 60 to 61 years later. Can you imagine now the day that we live, how far perhaps we have come from the true understanding of who, of who Jesus actually is? The supreme God. The Gnostics believe that, yes, Jesus was a lowercase God, but he was not the creator, he was the created. They believe that Father God created him, and the reason he couldn't be God, because all things physical, all matter is evil. So we are evil, everything that was made was evil, therefore God couldn't have made these things. What they did was, they perverted the word of truth, which was Jesus was everything that we need. Amen? Do you believe that? So today we live in no different time. Today we see so many different religions, so many different point of views, so many different worldviews that say, you know, Jesus was a good person. He was a prophet. Perhaps even he was the son of God. But to say Jesus is divine, to say Jesus is God cannot be true. And I'm going to tell you that is a lie straight from the pit of hell. Because if the enemy can take you away from understanding who Jesus actually is, he allows you then to walk into fear and a bunch of other things that cause when Jesus is not around. It's very interesting. I did a, a quick research here, and in America, they surveyed 3,000 American evangelicals. Evangelicals. This is the church. 3,000. And 78% of them believe this. They believe that Jesus was the first created being created by God the Father. Even the greatest being, but the being that was created by the Father. Do you see a problem with that? If you don't see the problem with that, I'm not going to shame you this morning, but I'm going to tell you that somewhere down the line, your truth has been perverted. To believe the God of the Bible is to believe Jesus was there at the beginning, he's there at the end, and he's there in between. 
He's the one who created all things, and in all things were things created. See, what happened is we've come into this doctrine of who God is, and I'm going to talk about that in a second. But we have relegated Jesus down to where we are. When he isn't who we are, he is God. Amen? So Paul then addresses this to the Gnostics and to the church who has allowed this perversion to come in. He says, guys, you've completely missed the mark here because he is supreme and has preeminence. So seven things Paul talks about. I'm going to list them off, all seven, and then we're going to dive deep into them as much as we can in the time that we have. So the first thing, if those who are taking notes, you're going to want to write this down. And I ask you, I encourage you, go back in the week and study. Don't take my word for it alone. Go and I guarantee if you ask God to speak to you and give you knowledge and understanding, wisdom and revelation, trust me, he's there for you. Seven things. He is the image of God. Amen? Say image of God. He is the firstborn of all creation. Say firstborn. He is the creator of all things. Say creator of all things. He is the head. Say head. Of the church. Amen? He's the firstborn from the dead. I'm going to say that again. He is the firstborn from the dead. He is all fullness, completeness, and abundance. And he has reconciled all things to himself. Amen? Amen. Let's go to the first one. He is the image of God. He is the exact representation of who God is. He is the perfect expression of God. The Bible says in John 14, verse 9, if you have seen me, then you have seen the Father. You see, here's one of the first lies that the Gnostics told. They said that Jesus was not God. He was not at the same level of the Father. But I want to tell you, that is, Pastor, can I say that word even though we're online? Hogwash. It's not the truth, it is a lie. You see, what happened is over time, and this has happened even in some different teachings and even in the church, we've, we've said that God means the Father. And Jesus is just the Son of God, and then we have the Holy Spirit. But that is also not the truth. Although God is the Father, so is Jesus, and so is the Holy Spirit. You see, what we've taken is we've taken the ultimate supremacy of God, the fullness of God, and we've broken it down into how, what makes sense to us. But God says, my thoughts, not your thoughts. You may not understand everything. But I want to tell you today that Jesus is just as much God as the Father is, and the Holy Spirit is too. Come on. But we've relegated Jesus to say, Jesus, you are a good man, and we're going to pray to you, but we talk to the Father. You see, he is one being. I want to explain something to you guys, and it's so important when we understand this, when we get into the scripture. God is one being. Who we are and what we are are two different things. I'm going to say that again. Who we are and what we are are two different things. Let me give you an example. Candace, Alicia, and myself standing in front of each other right now. Well, they're sitting, I'm standing. Who are we? We are human beings. I, I hope so, right? I'm a human being, right? Yeah. Are people agreeing? Are you, I'm an alien? <laughs> yes. And so are they. So who we are are human beings. But what I am, I am Ranjeev, she is Candace, and she is Alicia. But we are one being. That's the what we are, sorry. The who we are are our persons. Now let's take that on the other side. What God is, is God. That's his being. Who he is, is the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay? Thank you. That's good. But we got to understand this because this is what the Gnostics taught. They began to pervert the word and separate Jesus from the Father. See, it is a Godhead, three in one. So when we reference in our own mindset, and as we begin to minister to others, if anyone wants to know about the divinity of Christ, if you speak to someone and you're ministering to someone, point them to Colossians 1. 
and point them to John 1.1. 1, 1. But if we don't understand as believers that they are three in one, three distinct persons in one being, which is God, then we're already not at a good start. But we're going to be at a good start this morning because God has given us the spirit of truth. Amen? Three in one. Now, we can get into why that is so important here. Because he is the very image of God. He is not a duplicate. He is not a reflection. He is not a copy. He is not a knockoff. He is not a counterfeit. He is not an afterthought. He is not a creation. He is not a figment of our imagination. He wasn't a mythic story that was, re that was made or read. He is the exact representation of God. He is God over your children. He's God over your house. He's God over your generation. He is God over this nation. And he is God over the universe, the things above the earth, the things below the earth, what is visible and invisible. He is God over all. No one is above him. No one is beside him. I don't care what religion you are, what you may believe, there is no one else who can say that they are supreme over all. Because last time I checked, every prophet, whether they be anybody else, are still in the ground and buried. But we serve a Jesus that even death could not hold him captive. That he had resurrection power, not because he was a man, but because he was fully God. Fully man he died, but fully God he raised again. And fully God he's coming back to take his bride. And guess what? The same things that we have dead, he can resurrect. Come on, are you with me this morning? Do you understand the Jesus that you have inside of you? There is no one like him. There is no greater tool. I don't care. You can give me a nuclear weapon. It will stand nothing in front of Jesus because all things are under his feet. I'm excited. If you can tell. If not, check your pulse. He is the firstborn over all creation, number two. He has supremacy over all creation. He is superior over everything that was created. In the heavens, in the earth, and things below the earth, he is over all. I want you to understand something. For those taking notes, firstborn in this context does not mean created. Important, because there's a lot of false doctrines in Christianity itself, like the Jehovah Witness movement and the Mormon movement, that will say Jesus was created. But it's not true. This word does not mean created. If you actually look into the meaning of this word, it actually means the one who has been given all authority. The word firstborn is just like back in the day in the Old Testament when the firstborn was, was come and the father were to pass away or die. What they would do is they would give all authority to the firstborn. See, what Paul is saying here is not that Jesus was created, but that Jesus has all authority in and under heaven. He's not the firstborn. Sorry, he's not the first created, but he's the first and superior over all things. The Bible says in John 1, you know the scripture very well. In the beginning was the? And the word was? And the word was? So if he was there at the beginning, that means he superseded the beginning. In fact, he created this very thing that we call time. He does not work within time because he does not work within the thing that he has created. He supersedes the things that he's created. So for a second there, we have nothing to be afraid about. You see, we fear all these, all these different things because we don't understand the God that we serve. We don't understand the Jesus that is here for us. You know, it says over 80 times in Scripture, fear not. And when he says that, fear not, why? For I am with you. But that's so simple. What does that mean? What does that mean? When, when you begin to understand the significance of the with you, when you begin to understand the significance of I am, that is Jesus Christ talking to you and he says, you don't have to be afraid because I have not given you that, sp that spirit of fear. I have not created a spirit of fear. But what I have created is a spirit of power and of love and a sound mind that you can speak to anything with that power because I am living inside of you. I am the supreme one inside of you. There's nothing that you can face that I cannot take on. 
when you realize it's not you and yourself, but it's the Christ that is living inside of you. Come on, church. Are you excited this morning? He's given us the power. That word power is dunamis. Dynamite. But listen to this. This dynamite isn't waiting to explode. The dynamite has already exploded inside of you. Hello? The problem is sometimes we wait for this to explode and we don't realize that the explosion has already taken place. When he went on that cross and that veil was torn, guess what? The dynamite had already taken off and now lives inside of me and you. He's not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. Notice that sound mind is the mind of Christ. That perfect love is Christ. That power is Christ. You see, fear not is not a thing. It is a person, and that person's name is Jesus. We have the greatest weapon, church, through the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen? Amen. Number three. He is the creator of all things. All things were created by him, through him, and for him. Without him, nothing was created. Amen? John 1, 3 says, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. I'm going to read that again. We're talking about Jesus here. All things, say all things. Last time I checked, that meant everything. Everything on the earth, everything in heaven, everything below. All things were created by him, and without him, not anything was made. I want you to think about that for a second. That tells me that each person inside of this room, no matter where you are in your life, no matter what you're coming into this church with today, no matter what your background is, no matter what you have done that you think is unbelievable. Jesus tells us here, John tells us here, that without him, nothing was made. You are not a mistake. You are not an accident. We are not a random explosion. We are not a big bang theory. We are purposely, we are wonderfully, we are carefully handcrafted in the hand of Jesus himself. If you think today because of the way you look or what your background is or who you were born to makes really that big of a difference of God, I'm telling you it doesn't because it says here that without him nothing was created. So for the fact that you are here today breathing means that he said you are to be here today. It had to go through him, by him, and it has to be for him, which means you are for Christ. Don't let the enemy pervert the truth and say you have no meaning, you have no purpose. Don't let him wrap up your purpose in what you do or who you are. Wrap up your purpose on whose you are, who you were created for. We weren't created for ourselves. We weren't created for this creation. We were created for the creator. By him, through him, and for him. In our vernacular, for those who may not understand... He is the OG. Hey. Hey. (laughs) He's the OG. He's the original gangster. The originator. The alpha. Come on. The first. He is the last. He's everything in between. He's not a knockoff. He's not a counterfeit. He isn't a substitute. He is the thing. And we got to stop looking at other places, friends. Stop looking at this person and that person and other areas of truth. Because we can't find truth without Jesus. Because the truth is not a thing. The truth is a person. I feel God. And the original is always the most valuable. (laughs) <laughs> I joked this morning, when I was growing up, the big thing was FUBU. Remember FUBU? Any of my generation? Unfortunately, I had Lubus. <laughs> I couldn't afford the FUBUs. I didn't have Nikes, I had British Knights. I didn't have Jordans, I had Gordons. 
They look like it, but they weren't the same. There's a lot of gods that we're trying to, not we, but the world is trying to present to us. But guess what? There's only one original. They don't have the power. They don't have the redemption. They don't have the reconciliation. They don't have the forgiveness of sin. They don't sit on a throne right now making intercession for us. They can't call upon their name with all authority and power. But guess what? We do. We can call upon the name of Jesus no matter where we find ourselves. It doesn't matter what I've done, where I am. Where I'm going, I have power in the name of Jesus that is not in me, that is not of myself, but is fully in the power of Christ. So guess what? I can walk in boldness. I can walk with a strut. I can walk with my head up because I serve the king of all kings. You can call yourself whatever you want. That is fine and dandy. But guess what? You ain't nothing compared to this one called Jesus. And here's the beautiful part of it. Not only is he the original, so are you. You are not a copy. You are not a duplicate. You are not a mistake. Don't let the enemy come in and tell you that you don't have a purpose. He has handcrafted you. And guess what? He didn't write your name. He didn't write his name in your life in pen. He didn't sew it in thread. What he did is he took his finger, dipped it in his own blood, and righted it over your life. You are stamped with his signet. You are stamped with his approval. You are stamped with his reconciliation. You are worthy of something. Someone needs to hear that today. You came and you don't know why you're here. But you're here alone if it's just for the fact to know that Jesus created you for a purpose. And you would not have been created without his permission. Amen. Whew. It's not like me. I'm really not this tempered. <laughs> I'm, I'm more tempered, I mean. I'm not <laughs> That's weird, eh? He upholds everything with his word. His word. In the beginning was the, and the word was, and the word was. So his word is Jesus. He is the log. This is the logos. It is the written word. Jesus is the word of God. Everything that he says is can be held up in the word. You don't need to look for a seven help book, a 10 step this, a 10 step that. You can look straight to the author of this book because you can find Jesus all over the place in it. From Genesis to Revelation, nothing has ever changed. Jesus was there in the beginning. He's there in the end and everything in between. He upholds it with his word. There is no contradiction in this word. The Gnostics believed that we had to learn more, just like today. They believe we have to learn more. Times have changed, so the Bible must change. But guess what? The Bible has been and will always be ahead of our time. Because it was created by the one who is not subject to it. He is the head of the church. Amen? Someone say amen to that. He is the head of the church. Not a pastor, not a prophet, not an evangelist. Not a speaker who has a million people is not the head of the church. The head of the church is one person, and that is Jesus. I thank God every day that we are a part of a church at APC where the pastor does not bring attention to himself, but he points to the one who has called him. You'll never hear Pastor Tony say, my church, my church, my church. He is nothing but a servant who is honored, but a servant to Jesus Christ. He is the head of the church. But some have this false gospel that it is my ministry, my anointing, my calling. No, 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 no. It's Jesus' ministry. Jesus is calling. Jesus is anointing. And we just happen to have the privilege for him to join and let us partake in what he's already doing. So if you're going all over the place, this is not to shame you. Looking for the next prophet to speak to you. I got news for you. You can find a lot more value in opening up the Bible because you don't need the prophet. You can get the one who created the prophet. Open it up. He is the word. By the way, to learn about him and to have a relationship with him, you got to read it. And to read it, you got to open it. And to open it, you got to have a Bible. YouTube is not a Bible. 
Google is not a Bible. There is nothing like the word of God. He's the firstborn of the church. Show me a church that doesn't have Jesus, and I'll show you a church that is out of whack. But show me a church where Jesus is the center of it all, and I'll show you a church that is fruitful. Listen to me, I want to tell you something. Don't get confused between the difference of growth and expansion. There's a lot of churches that are expanding, but they are not growing. God hasn't called us to expand. He called us to grow in spiritual things as our spirit prospers, so do we. He is the head of the church, and he gives life to the church. He is the bride. We are the groom. But unfortunately, in some cases, we've cheated on him. We've had an affair on the groom. And we've had an affair on him with ourselves. Because somehow, just like it did in this time with the Gnostics, it became about us and our knowledge. It came about, it came about what we could do or not do. I want to tell you, everyone, if you read the Bible, one thing it tells us is that we are not good enough. But because of Jesus, because of the cross, because of grace and because of mercy, he has made us righteous in the sight of God. It's not about ourselves. It is all about Jesus. The song says, Jesus at the center of it all. You want to know why? Because all things are in him. All things are by him. All things are through him. All things are for him. Once we take him out, all things are all over the place. Everything is in disaster. Everything is on chaos. You want to know why the world is going to hell in a handbasket? It's because they forgot who Jesus is. Examine your life. Maybe things are a little bit chaotic. Let me challenge to ask you this question. Where have you placed Jesus? Is he a side piece? Ooh, I didn't even plan on saying that. <laughs> is he your side piece that when you want a little something, you go to him? Or is he the lover of your soul? Is he the one you seek after? Is he the only one that you need? Do you believe it in the depths of your heart? Because if he's not, you're having an affair. Praise God. He is the firstborn from the dead. Remember what I said about firstborn? It doesn't mean first created. But he has supremacy. He has authority. He is the first fruit from those who slept. That's in 1 Corinthians 15, 20. He is superior in excellence over the things that are dead. So not only is he God over the living, not only is he God in this earth, but he is a God over everything that has died. Let that sink in. He is God over the things under the earth that are dead. He's taken the keys to hell. We talked about it coming out of resurrection. You want to know why he died? He died because he would show hell, look, I'm even the king over you. Amen. So what does that mean to us? Think about it for a second. I think there's some things in this room that God has spoken to you individually about. There's plans, there are purposes, there are things that God has invested in you, but they have become dead. For whatever reason, maybe it was church hurt, maybe it was a person, maybe it was your family, but God has invested something inside of you. And I want to encourage you today that those dead things can become alive. That the things that you thought were gone and I was too old and I couldn't do it and I made too many mistakes. Jesus says, guess what? I am the God over the dead. I have supremacy over the things that you feel have gone away. The opportunities that you think have gone by. And I am God over that. And I am telling you, dead things can come alive. He is God over the dead things in your life. Anyone need that this morning? If you have some dead things in your life, I don't want to come, I don't want you to come here today just to think it's a bunch of words and it's a bunch of excitement. You need to leave this place changed. So you know what love says? Love says, yeah, I'll accept you as you come, but I won't let you leave the same way. So I challenge you today to ask yourself, 
Are there some dead things that need to come alive? Perhaps there's some things in this church that you need to be doing, but you have ran and you have ran and you have run away. But God is calling you back home today to say, if you are going to make me the first in your life, if I'm going to be the lover of your soul and not just a side piece, walk into what I have called you to do. Dead things come alive. Dead bones come alive. He is the fullness of God. For in him dwelleth the all fullness of the Godhead. And number seven, he has reconciled all things to himself. Meaning that he has changed the condition of one thing to another. He's removed his enmity to us. He's removed the hatred towards us because of sin. And now he says, I have given you an inheritance. I've given you unity. I've given you peace. All of which is wrapped in Jesus. So friends, here is the mystery. The mystery has been revealed and it is no longer a mystery. The mystery is now that Jesus now lives inside of you. And we have now become the hope for these nations. There is no one like him. He is all fullness. And he's reconciled all things to himself. If you're struggling this morning with your purpose, if you're struggling this morning with where you find yourself, I want to tell you, you're at a good place right now. Right here, this moment, this time. The one who is supreme over all things. If you're struggling with fear and anxiety, I want to tell you, you don't have to fear. For the one who's created all things is inside of you and with you. You know, he says he's the alpha and the omega, but he's also everything in between. As you walk in this journey of life, as you go through difficulties, he is there with you. His rod and his staff will comfort you. He's even prepared a table before you in the presence of your enemies. He's anointed your head with oil, so much so that your cup runs over. And he said, mercy and goodness will fall to you all the days of your life. But that is for the sons and the daughters of the Most High God. Amen? Amen. Come on, praise God for that word. <laughs>